Continuing the Lord's Prayer, petition number three, hallowed be thy name. One, this petition asks that God's character or name be revered. Name is a usual way for the Bible to indicate far more than a way of designating a person. It often designates the character of a person. And when we talk about the name of God, who has many names, we invariably mean the character of God. So what we are praying when we follow our Lord's instruction and say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your name, what we mean is hallowed be you. Hallowed be the God who has all the attributes we have seen in nature revealed and in the revelation of Scripture revealed. So number two, all we know and far more about the attributes of God, eternality, infinity, power, holiness, justice, wrath, love are in view here. Everything we know about God, we are here praising. You know that famous statement there that when you pray, you're a Calvinist. And when you preach, you're an Arminian. Well, this is certainly true. When you pray, you are a Calvinist. And I even mentioned number three. For example, no one may offer the Lord's Prayer who is not a Calvinist, at least in spirit. Because what you're doing is praising God for everything He is, which includes sovereign. He has decreed everything that comes to pass. He is in hell as well as in heaven and on the earth. And you are going to praise Him for reprobation as well as election, and you are going to adore Him for hell as well as for heaven. And if you don't do that, you ought not to be using the Lord's Prayer, and you are lying when you say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Make this very clear, my friends. Whatever problems you have about some of the revelations of Holy Scripture, once you are satisfied they are the revelations of this infallible Word, it's not enough to know them. You must rejoice in them. And just like that girl I mentioned and so on, you may feel I was never so close to not being a Christian. And I'm going to say to you, as I said to her, you're never so close to being a Christian. You feel by these things you're never so close to not being a Christian, breaking with the whole thing. I can't accept that. I'm like Larry. I can't believe in a God who makes everything to glorify Him. I can't be in a God, believe in a God who chooses to save some and not others. I can't believe in a God who sentences people to eternal torment. All right, that is your privilege in this world to say this, but don't pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, because he reveals these as parts of his character, his will, his decree, his decision, his activity. Now, and if you can't acquiesce in what he has revealed in his word, you can't pray. That's another way of saying you have to be a Calvinist to pray. This statement usually says you're a Calvinist when you pray. That's another way of putting it. You're a Calvinist when you pray. That is, you recognize everything depends upon God. But if when you get up from your knees, you act as if everything depends on you, then of course you were a hypocrite when you were praying. And the true you comes on the scene after you stop praying and start living your life. Now this, of course, distinction is a hopeless one and utterly impossible. If it's right to be a Calvinist when you pray, of course you have to be a Calvinist when you preach and when you witness. 
because what you're preaching and witnessing is the same name. What you pray will be hallowed. If this were actually the truth, what you would be doing would be recognizing the true God when you pray and then preaching a false deity when you actually witness to him. Manifestly, that's a contradiction in terms. I've never gone into a full-scale critique of Arminianism, but I think I've given enough running comments on it for you to realize that according to this theology, God's activities are determined by man, not man by God. Man takes the role of the supreme, and it subordinates the deity to human supremacy. And that, of course, is a travesty when preaching as well as it would be in praying. But the point we're observing here in the very beginning of the Lord's Prayer is that we want His character, His being, His decisions, all of His activities to be reverenced, adored, hallowed. That's the meaning of the term. Number four. That is to say, the person must reverence the sovereign mercy or the name of him who will have mercy on whom he will and whom he will he hardens. In Romans 9, 18, now let me read once again. I presented this to you before, but I'm presenting it now in an even more poignant context of your life of prayer according to the pattern which our Lord actually gave us. That is to say, number four, the person must reverence the sovereign mercy or the name of him who, among other things, will have mercy on whom he will, and whom he will, he hardens. Whom he will, nobody has any objection to God having mercy, but whom he will, he hardens. I've shown you already more Christians object to this that agree with it. Arminian, by definition, is opposed to that statement. He will never allow himself to admit it because it's a statement inspired by God through the Apostle Paul. It's the Word of God, so it has to be true. And no Arminian who believes the Bible is going to say God errs or God misrepresents him something or something like that, what the Arminian does to relieve his pressure is to interpret it away. Don't have time to show you how he tries to escape it. He can't escape it on his type of theology, and if he's going to follow it, he has to give up his particular type of theology. But when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we say, blessed be the God who hardens, as well as shows mercy. And my friends, if you can't say that from the heart, don't do just to repeat the words. If you can't say that from the heart, blessed be the God who hardens whom he will, who re reprobates whom he will. You can't pray the Lord's Prayer. Say something that you wouldn't expect to come from the lips of a minister. You better stop praying. That kind of praying is worse than no praying. You are saying, unhallowed be thy name. You are actually saying, our Father who art in heaven, I despise your name. I hate your name. I've heard Arminians say the equivalent of that many, many times. They would never say those words. And I will never say they'll say those words. But when they call Calvinism a damnable heresy, and sometimes the worst heresy that's ever plagued the Christian church, and some of them have said it's far worse than unbelief, it's far worse than Islam or any other false religion, when they say that, I'm saying to them and I'm saying to any of you who are listening to this now, and please hear me, I say it to you affectionately, I'm warning you that when you think and teach such things as that, though you don't use these words, what you must mean is, unhallowed be thy name. And if you don't dare utter those words, you don't dare entertain those other ideas, I would say. If I'm wrong, 
show me where I'm wrong. But if I'm right, either stop praying or start believing in the true God. This is life eternal that they know thee, the only true God. The only true God is a sovereign God who will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will, he hardens. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe in the only true God. And you're far worse than a Muslim because he doesn't make any claim to believe in the divine Christ. And you do. He doesn't make any claim to be bound in this entire Bible. And you do. If this is the greatest privilege a man has to pray, it certainly would be obvious. It's the greatest prostitution of a means of grace to pray hypocritically. My friends, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm trying to win you. I'm trying you to get to see what you're doing here. When you ask for the hallowing of God's name, you ask for the hallowing of the God who's revealed himself in this book. And if he has revealed himself, as I give you an instance of it in Romans 9, 18, it's all over the book. And you don't believe that. It's your privilege not to believe it. It's your right to go to hell if you insist on it. But it is not your privilege to call yourself a Christian. And it's not your right to preach that as if that were the word of God. And certainly it's the utmost folly to say, hallowed be thy name, when in your heart and your mind and your whole message, you really mean unhallowed be your name. And you don't believe in the only true God. Uh, Arminianism is 90% of evangelical Christianity at the present day. I can't imagine my not speaking to some of that persuasion over these tapes. I'm sure it'll reach some like that. I'm sure it's possible most of the people here will actually be of that persuasion. And some of you may be furiously angry with me for saying it because these are hard words. I'm telling you to stop praying. I'm telling you to stop preaching. I'm telling you to stop calling yourself a Christian if you will not acknowledge what God has said in his word. Now, certainly you would recognize this much. If I am right, I couldn't admonish you any other way. If what I'm saying is indeed the truth of God, you will certainly realize what I'm saying to you is an act of love and not animosity. I'm saying it because I love you and not because I hate you. I'm saying it because I want you to live forever and not die forever. Now, once again, I hasten to add, I'm not saying that an Arminian, an Arminian is a lost soul. I'm not saying he's not a Christian. I entertain the possibility that a true Christian can misunderstand the Bible this way. I'm saying two things, though. He has no right to teach if he doesn't understand these things. And if he does know that when he prays, hallowed be thy name, that carries with it the implication that he praises God even when he hardens sinners and dooms them to hell, and he doesn't do that, then he knows full well he is no Christian at all. I'm not saying a, an Arminian recognizes that, you understand. An Arminian may be a very ardent Christian who doesn't belong in the pulpit. But what I am saying is a man who is in the pulpit as an Arminian may still be a Christian, but if as an Arminian scholar he knows that when God says in his word that he hardens some people in contrast to the saving mercy he bestows on other people, and he does not, this Arminian teacher does not acquiesce in that, he is not hallowing the divine name. He has no right to offer the Lord's prayer. And if he can't pray, he can't be a Christian. You get me? 
I'll say it once again because it's so easy to misunderstand this very, very vital aspect of my teaching. This is a par, one of hundreds of verses indicating some of the activity of God alongside of His unspeakable mercy. This is as much a part of His nature as it is to be merciful. This is the way God reveals Himself. And that if you accept that, you are recognizing the only true God. If you don't accept that, you may still be believing in the only true God who doesn't understand that aspect of the divine feet, divine character. And that's the reason I can entertain that an Arminian believer who is not a minister could be a true Christian and ignorant of this verity. When I go on in the second place to address myself to Arminian ministers who make up 90% of the conservative ministers of our time, I say to you, since you know far more than the people you teach, if you understand that, you may not understand it, not to be, not, not to be in the pulpit if you don't, but if you understand that for what it says and still fight against it as an Arminian by basic uh, adherence of that system does fight against it, then I'm saying very solemnly to you, I can't entertain the hope that you're a Christian at all. You're a living hypocrite. You don't believe in the only true God and you know it. And you can't honestly say, hallowed be thy name. And you know it. I'm appealing to you to repent and believe and be saved, just as I'm hoping that your Arminian followers, who may be genuine Christians, that they will learn a more perfect way than the way that they now know, in part, and really believe what they do believe, not realizing that they are resisting God in much of their understanding. Please understand me correctly. I don't want not to be heard, and I don't want to be heard wrongly. I've sometimes said I don't mind being martyred for what I do believe. I hate to be martyred for what I don't believe. So at least if you disagree with me here at this very vital point, see that you understand me correctly and then see that you can really answer it. And I invite any of you of that persuasion, please write to me. You can always reach me through the study center through by means of which this tape goes out. And they will forward a letter or they'll tell you where to write or telephone directly if you wish. I invite your uh, response, no matter how vehement it may be, as long as it's honest and as long as you're willing to have a cool discussion on the merits of these uh, points that I'm here mentioning. Number seven, such are Calvinists, and in that sense all Christians are Calvinists, even some who call it blasphemy. This is just reiterating the same thing with respect to lay people who don't understand these things and so misunderstand them that they'd actually call it blasphemy, I still entertain the fact that they are Christian. You may wonder why I'm laboring this point. It goes back again to John 3.10. Are you a teacher of Israel, he said to Nicodemus, and don't understand these things? The implication is clear. If he didn't understand these points about the sovereignty of God and regeneration, which carries predestination and reprobation right along with it, and so on. He was not fit to be a minister, a teacher in Israel. But he never said that about the Israelites in general. He never said the equivalent, are you an Israelite and don't understand these things? As much as to intimate a person could be a true believer without understanding these things. But he'd have no right to be in the pulpit. And then I address those of you who are in the pulpit and what I'm saying is, if you know far more than the people you teach, and you know about texts like that, and a hundred others as well, now if you don't understand them, get out of the ministry. If you do understand them and don't acquiesce in them, get out of the Christian church. You can't even pray. You can't really desire God's name to be hallowed, since God's name is revealed in the text of Scripture, which you yourself are rejecting. Number eight. Remember that girl I mentioned who was never so close to not being a Christian. She was never so close to not praying as the Lord taught her. What about you, reader? Number nine, are you suffering for righteousness' sake? Or are you just suffering? If you are a Christian, you don't have a stiff upper lip. You have a mouth full of praise 
for him from whom all blessings come, hallowed be thy name. That may seem like an abrupt turn, but it's abrupt mainly not from the propositions made here so much as from the elaboration which I have made on the board and free from the uh, text here. But the reason I bring up in point number nine, are you suffering for righteousness' sake or are you just suffering? The fact that if you say, hallowed be thy name, you are praising God for everything he does. And that would include some awesome things. Right now we're watching three whales up near Anchorage, Alaska, trying to get uh, a breath of air every 10 minutes. You know how those people have made a place in the ice so that they can get that breath of air, otherwise they would suffocate over under this ice and so on. Now, there are some people who just can't believe in God who would allow a gray whale to suffer and to die. There are some people who can't live with the idea that there can be a God in heaven and a child who ever dies in its mother's body or shortly afterwards with elephantiasis. There are plenty of people who read history as a butcher's block and they just can't believe that God in heaven has anything to do with it. This is just a secular world, you see, that takes that kind of stance. I've been talking previously about the evangelical world, 90% of it Arminian, 10% of it Reformed. Now I'm talking about the outside world, many of whom are in the church, as we've said before. For you to pray, as the Lord taught you to pray, is to bring the ridicule of the world upon you. You are actually happy in honoring God and hallowing his name when these monstrosities take place, such as the ones I have mentioned and in much more horrible things than anything I have mentioned right now, are you suffering for righteousness sake? You see now what I'm driving at. When you pray with great confidence and joy, the joy of the Holy Ghost, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, a whole world of humanists and secularists despise you, that you can actually believe there's a God in heaven in a world like this, that you can actually justify because of God's activity this particular kind of gruesome suffering of which we have an instance on the front page every day and so on. They think you've got to be out of your mind. That's the reason I ask, are you sincerely praying, hallowed be thy name, and believing it at the same time, and suffering for righteousness' sake. Because if you are, as I say, all the secularists will ridicule you and think you are naive at the best and absolutely monstrous at the worst. If they don't have that opinion of you, it has to be because they don't know you. And if it's your fault that they don't know you, because what you say to God and what you say to them is two different things, then, of course, you've got to ask once again about your actual state before God. If you are saying one thing to God and another thing to men to avoid the suffering for righteousness' sake, you're far worse than these men who are secularists out here because they at least aren't hypocrites. They don't pretend to worship the God. You do. But here you are one with them, as far as they can see. While you want to be one with him in your life of prayer. I'm not talking about Arminianism now or anything else. I'm talking about anybody who prays and doesn't suffer for righteousness' sake can't very well be sincere in his prayer because the world about which you are surrounded is not a prayer which rejoices in what's going on in this world and who actually calls for God's name to be hallowed. Yeah, I know what you're saying at that point. You're saying, well, God himself isn't pleased with what's going on in this world. He warns sinners about the wages of sin. He calls them to repentance. So I'm not believing that God is pleased with this world. No, not that way. But at the other level of God's decreeing all that comes to pass, that is a part of his sovereignty, as we have noticed, even with respect to the hardening of some, and that hardening of some, of course, leads them to these monstrous deeds of which the secularists and the humanists are always complaining. 
Remember, we discussed before the difference between the preceptive will of God and the decretive will of God. God calls for perfection. God has actually decreed what comes to pass, most of which is sin. And when you say, hallowed be thy name, you not only reverence God as the God of perfect holiness who commands his creatures to believe and practice perfect holiness, but who has also decreed every solitary event that has ever happened or ever will happen in human history. And if you say that and make that clear in your prayer and not out there, you are not being true prayers of the Lord's Prayer is what I am saying here. So I'm saying to anybody who's a Calvinist and not an Arminian who says he's a Calvinist and is a Calvinist in sincerity when he prays and then denies it out here, of course he's not in sincerity at all in his heart with what his brain is apparently convinced of. Finally, number 10. When Paul and Silas were in prison, they sang, Acts 16, 25. Hallowed be thy name is virtually what they were singing. So must we in or out of prison. I close with that note just to remember not only that God has hardened some and he's allowed many, many miseries in this fallen world of ours, but he also chastens his people, subjects us to a great deal of suffering, and here's an instance of it, as I say, probably the most godly follower that Jesus Christ has ever had, the Apostle Paul. He's thanked for his witness to saving grace by being cast into prison. And it sets him singing. Whatever God ordains is good, may be painful, may hurt, may be frustrating, they call for all sorts of change of plans and all the rest of it, but we wouldn't have it any other way. Hallowed be thy name. As I say, if after this particular videotape, Jack and I have a major accident on Interstate 4 and we're suspended in intensive care for weeks of unremitting agony, remember, hallowed be thy name. We'll be singing in our heart. If we can't be singing in intensive care, we wouldn't want it otherwise. All this is wrapped up in this petition, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.